How many are identified? I, I, I said I was going to talk about this overlap. I just have one slide here because I'm not really sure how well um, we understand this problem um, in, the, in the research community. The huge change recently has been the explosion, if you will, of identification in the category of autism. But what you see is this, I just, this quote just came across the wires a couple days ago, so I threw it in. This is New York City, I think. Um, they, they saw this big increase in autism and this big decrease in EBD. And someone sort of scratched their heads and thought, what's going on here? The same, it, it's clearly some of that is related. The other category that's picking up a lot of kids that we would have thought of as having EBD is OHI. If their if they're problem is more in the, especially in the ADHD realm, and I know there's presentations here these two days around that very topic. I don't claim expertise in that, but OHI is picking up a lot of kids who have ADHD, which if you've seen the, di the Venn diagrams, ADHD, I can't do it here, ADHD and EBD, do overlap considerably. So um, I, there's other categories picking up some of this three to six percent that we're maybe talking about. So again, we're not talking about identifying whatever I said, 0.8 percent of kids and the rest are on the streets. They might be in other categories. They might be in tiered systems. The question is, are they being served appropriately? And I'm still back to, well, who are the ones who were actually getting identified? What do we know about them? and how they're getting identified. Do we identify the right students? I used to ask this question. You know, when I was a teacher, I taught self-contained EBD, because that was the only model that existed when I was first teaching. Uh, it probably still exists, but it's, it's more rare now. Uh, obviously, more inclusive models are out there. And I remember, it, it, my, it's 20 years ago, so you know, your memory is what your memory is. I, I remember it as being a daily occurrence. It probably wasn't. But a teacher would see me in the hallway with my four, six kids. You know, that's all I had in my self-contained classroom. And say, I got one that belongs in here. I, he's coming. I mean, every teacher in the building had one, right? So did they, did they really have one that, that really belonged in there? I mean, my, my response was, you have no idea what these kids are capable of. And if they ever said, if they ever dared say, boy, I wish I had your classroom, six kids, how hard can that be? I said, come on, I will trade you right now. The, the, the most challenging, I mean, I'm talking to EBD people here, I can tell. So you know this, but the, the most challenging year I ever had, I had four students, literally only four. I didn't have five, six, seven, I had four the whole year in a self-contained elementary classroom. How easy could that be? I'm telling you, I nearly died. <laughs> and, and, if, and if any teacher would ever say, well, I can handle behavior, I was like, then come on in here and, and they will rock your world. I mean, these kids could light it up and, and work off each other. Little kids, they weren't, they weren't big enough to hurt me unless they threw a de you know, chair at me. But so anyway, how many times have you heard a teacher say one of their kids in regular ed probably belongs in EBD? Now, if that child really does have a disorder and for whatever reason we have not picked that up or identified it, that's a false negative. We didn't identify it, but it really exists. Second question, how often do you hear a special ed teacher, so me in my self-contained room, get a new student and scratch my head and think, why is he in here? He has no problems. Behavior seems good, academic performance, relation, you know, all that. he's not meeting the criteria. How often does that happen? My experience, almost never. Maybe once. I tried to figure this out the other day. I think I only taught, I was always self-contained. I think I only taught a total of maybe 90 to 100 kids over my years of teaching in my, you know, that were my kids, self-contained. I may have had one who probably could have transitioned out. Now, I learned later he had had some psychiatric issues and was even hospitalized briefly. So I think he was just transitioning back. But he had a good command of his world, and so I think he was going to move on. But I didn't have anybody else. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't on the brink of engaging them in more regular ed. I was on the brink of keeping them out of lockup. 
I mean, these kids were about to hurt people, including me. I mean, I was scared that they were going to get a hold of weapons or get into cars. I mean, when they were eight years old. I mean, the, the, it wasn't, you know, let's get them into the, this math class or that math class. It was, how can I keep all of us alive today? So my experience was, with that small number of kids who were identified, I wasn't seeing a lot. Now, I'm open to suggestions. I, of course, I've just... No one's going to speak up now, but do you find kids in either of those categories maybe more than another? And by the way, that's, that's what I'm talking about as a, a, a false positive, meaning we identified this kid, but he really doesn't have the needs that would warrant special education. Here's, here's where I'm trying to lead you. There's arguments that disproportionality is related to false positives. Now, it probably is, it, it conceptually. What we have to figure out is, numbers-wise, if, if that's true, who are these kids? I mean, who, who are they? How'd they get identified? Now, the argument is out there that we're, we're, we may have, and I'm not saying it's, a, it's an argument. I mean, there's different factions, and you'll have your own opinions. But there's an argument out there that there is some false positives going on. We don't know the extent to which it's going on or which groups, and by groups I mean racial ethnic groups as well as elementary, middle, high school, boys, girls, withdrawn, anxious kids, depressed kids versus acting out. So there's, there's, it's very complicated. I sound like a professor now, um, in, in that I don't have any answers. Um, False positives, okay, I already, already sort of defined these, but it, you get what it is. Let's move to the diagram here. So the, a false positive, false negative, and I don't want to harp on this, but make sure it's clear because this is where we're headed. This is kids the school does not identify as eligible. That's the kids the school identifies as eligible. So they're all positives. Positive meaning they were identified. Negative meaning not identified. And then on this axis, they don't have a disorder. They really don't. Like in truth, in real life, honest to goodness, don't have a disorder. Here they do have a disorder. So what we're talking about is true negatives. They don't have a disorder and we didn't identify them. That's the vast majority of kids, however you count it. It's at least 94 to 97% of the school population. They don't have a disorder and we didn't identify it. So we're good. We should pat ourselves on the back. We also, I think, identify, I say about 1%, it's actually a little under, if, if you buy that there aren't a lot of kids identified that shouldn't be, we can kind of say that's probably accurate too, but that's a true positive category. Okay, so these are the ones we're right on. They don't have a disorder, we didn't identify one, we didn't say they did. These kids have the disorder and we did identify them. Add these numbers up, we're at 95 to 98 percent of our school population. That sounds like a great number, right? Like, boy, we're really successful. Well, the problem is, who's in these boxes? And what people ask is, what's the greater concern here? Now, I don't want to get too philosophical, it's a little early in the day for me, but if special education identification was a great thing, And if your kid comes home and says, I qualified for the gifted program, you're pretty excited that they're going to get those special ed services. Special services. If your kid qualifies for services under the category of EBD, I don't think people are jumping up and down with... And now, now there they should be some relief, like, finally we're getting the help we need. But just, I'm talking in the popular culture, it's not viewed as a great thing. So we're very concerned about that group. We're very careful not to identify kids who don't really have the disorder. Now what's interesting is something like tier one interventions, universal interventions, or, or any sort of preventive effort that we do, preschool, kindergarten, that's, that's universal, people get a little nervous when we start screening kids. You know, the old, the, or not the old, the, the original multiple gating procedures that Walker and them talked about would screen and say, you know what, there's some kids who might be at risk. 
not not over the edge, you know, antisocial behavior, but might be at risk. So let's do some broad universal interventions with them. Well, people got nervous that we were signaling, singling out kids for services who didn't really have services. We're just going to teach them some social skills, some, some, you know, how to get along with peers, how to resolve a conflict. I, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't this, this horrible thing. Somehow special ed services get cast as a negative, like, dun, 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 you've been identified and now you get services shouldn't be that way. But at any rate, these are the two blocks we're, we're worried about. I think you've already alluded to um, who's in them and who's not. Um, I think the one comment was pretty insightful that this category might be a lot of kids who are not the acting out variety, but the more anxious, withdrawn. And we talk about in, in later years, middle and high school, covert antisocial behavior. You're familiar with covert versus overt. Overt antisocial behavior is bopping the kid next to you in the nose or, you know, cussing out the teacher. Covert is stealing the teacher's purse when the teacher's not in the room or vandalizing the school on the weekend or setting a fire or some, you know, when no one's around. Those kids sometimes do okay in school. They show up, they pass, but they're doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes that no one knows about. So that group as well as the anxious, withdrawn, depressed group, I think fills up that category over there. They probably have a disorder. Who do we identify? Okay, remember we're back to, I guess the lower right quadrant of identifying the right kids. The kids who are in that category are almost exclusively conduct disorder externalizers. Now I often did have a mix. I had one or two kids in my, in my every class that I taught who was the more anxious withdrawn, but they had some very bizarre behavior to go along with it that caught the attention of people. They weren't just anxious or withdrawn. They maybe had some either psychotic type stuff, you know, concerns with detachment from reality, frankly. So, you know, there was something that came to people's attention. They've also, they're also kids who have shown antisocial behavior for a long time. There's great studies on this that when we identify a kid, you know, whatever, fourth grade, first grade, sixth grade, when you start taking a history on this kid, you can almost always get previous teachers and parents to say, oh yeah, we noticed this about four years ago. And I think that's one of the averages I've seen in a couple of studies that people literally say that the rate is roughly four years, three to four years prior to identification when people started saying, this kid's really having problems. Now, if we're doing stuff, if we're doing interventions, pre-referral type interventions, tiered systems are in place and we're trying things, that's, that's a good thing. But there's a real lag in accessing those services. Who's less likely to be identified? We already just, I w just went through those. We've already highlighted. It's the internalizers or the covert antisocial behavior. With me on that? You buy that? 